uh, today's lecture on early Middle High German. First, some words on the internal structure of this period. Middle High German, unlike the macrostructural periodization of German language history, uh, no canonical mode, uh, model has prevailed for the internal periodization of Middle High German. Um, most language histories make do with the solution of dividing the three centuries of Middle High German into these three sub-periods, uh, early Middle High German from 1050 to uh, 1170, so-called classical Middle High German from uh, 1170 to 1250, and late Middle High German from 1250 to 1350. I will devote the next three sessions to one of the Middle High German subperiods. Uh, the common thread in these sessions will be a presentation of the textual tradition and how uh, this tradition was handled, handled by text producers and text recipients. I went into the fundamental problems of such periodization models uh, last week, and we don't have to go over this again now. But I would like to point out that I put the period defining uh, attribute classical in a quotation marks for the next, for the period from 1170 to 1250. I'll explain the reasons why in the next lecture. Now, uh, early Middle High German. From a historical perspective, the first subperiod is characterized by the final break between the Western and Eastern churches the victory of William the Conqueror at the Battle of Hastings, the investiture controversy and Henry IV's journey to Canossa, or the First Crusade. Of course, these events and people have no direct influence on the course of German language history. The religious reform movements that emanated from the monasteries of Cluny, Hirsau, and Gauss in the 11th century are of greater importance for the history of language and literature of the time. These movements aimed to implement the Benedictine rule in its, in its original strictness in monastic life practice. After 1100, out of the same spirit, new orders were founded. The Cistercians and the Primonstratensians, their monasteries soon became important forces in the economic and cultural life of the surrounding areas. The Cistercians in particular uh, who, as a matter of principle, set up their new foundations away from settlements and cities, played a major role in land development and later in the colonization of the East, as did others that took in lay brothers and lay sisters. How and to what extent did these and other developments affect the attestation of German in the 11th and 12th centuries? And what sources do we rely on for an historical linguistic study the graphic you see uh, behind me offers an initial overview. I'll explain it briefly. Only 55 manuscripts from the 11th century contain German texts at all. These differ considerably in their scope. Uh, Latin manuscripts that only contain a short German text, such as prayer or sermon, are given equal weighting as early Middle High German composite manuscripts that transmit several longer poems. The number doubles in the 12th century, 55 to uh, 131. But there is no sudden increase until the 13th century, as you can see, which now uh, longer belongs to the early Middle High German period and will therefore only be dealt with later. Which texts are these uh, specifically? Religious texts have been written in the vernacular since the middle of the 11th century. In this respect, nothing has changed since the old High German period. What is new, however, is the function of these texts. Whereas, with a few exceptions, the old High German texts were tools for better understanding of what developing in Latin text, in early Middle High German, the autochthonous German language poems are being written. The larger Literary Old High German and Old Saxon texts originated in some important monastic centers, such as Fulda, Weissenburg, St. Gallen. They can be linked directly or indirectly to the cultural and political interests of kings or emperors. At its core was a desire to create a unified Christian people in the empire 
to convey the teachings and norms to which people of the empire had to adhere. At various synods and in several decrees of the Carolingian period, for example, it was urged that all inhabitants of the empire should know the central beliefs and master the elementary texts. This was only possible if translations were preferred and made available beforehand. A completely different picture emerges in the early Middle High German period. Texts can no longer be assigned to individual literary centres. The authors are no longer writing because of impulses from above, but of their own accord. However, the literature of the first Middle High German period is still essentially religious literature. Who were these texts written for? This period not only saw the founding of numerous monasteries, but also the founding of entire religious orders, which led to the emergence of a new group of recipients of spiritual literature, lay brothers and nuns who did not speak Latin. But in addition to this, in other lay circles outside the monasteries, there was growing interest in theological questions beyond the elementary minimum instruction that the Carolingian ordinances had already prescribed between lay brothers and lay sisters behind monastic wards and lay people outside the monasteries. So another group of people who only decided to enter monastic life at a late age. It was mainly widowed men and women from aristocratic social classes who spent their last years in the monastery and handed over their fortune when they entered the monastery. They too had to be served with appropriate reading material. On the other hand, the vernacular literature of the 11th and earliest, early 12th centuries is ignorant of these themes that certainly circulated in the true, so to speak, vernacular and were occasionally even written in Latin. No love greetings, no hunts, no battle-hardened heroes. Instead, early <coughs> Middle High German literature is dominated by poetry not aimed at providing pleasure and entertainment, but rather the salvation of people's souls. The religious literature of early Middle High German already has an astonishing, astonishing, astonishingly differentiated range of text types, as can be seen in the following synopsis uh, by uh, Christa Bertelsmeier Kiest. The traditional and the new stand side by side. The late Old High German authors, Notka and Willy Ram, continue to be copied well into the 12th century as were uh, Latin German interlinear translations and small catechetical texts such as Credo and Paternoster. But, uh, but the new genre of religious poetry already accounts for a considerable proportion of the vernacular text production in uh, early Middle High German. That's uh, at the bottom. The aim of today's lecture are twofold. Firstly, it will be important to outline the linguistically relevant conditions under which these texts came about and the factors that influenced them. And secondly, it will be necessary to explore which aspects of language history these texts offer value to as a source. These two perspectives cannot always be separated. Points of view that are more literary historical must also be touched on several times. But I think it's a mistake to believe that historical linguistics and literary studies are two areas that have, have nothing to do with each other. For the sake of time, however, I can only go into a few text samples to only deal with three selected areas from a historical linguistics perspective. First, I would like to start with an example from religious practice. The 11th and 12th, early 12th centuries are characterized by a changed relationship between the individual and the world and almost speak of a new subjectivism in the religious sphere, which was, that's a, a, from, a quote from Gisela Vollmann Profe, the best expert on this uh, period from a theological uh, point of view. The Christian faith is experienced personally and subjectively no longer just as a duty ordered from above. Typical of this changed understanding are, for example, the early Middle High German laments for sins, which are kept in an individual tone and take the place of the older formal confessions. Religious edification is combined with aesthetic standards. Textual comparison should make this clear. The confession of having sinned against the law of chastity appears in the old High German Lausch confession, 
9th century within a list-like series amongst numerous other conceivable transgressions. Ich Gynides, Abunstes, Spis Bracha, Sverienes, Firi Lustio, Zitior Folasaro, Ubarmodi, Gaili, Slavheiti, Tragi Gottes Ambachtes, Uoro Vileno, Farligero, Inti Mordes, Inti Mans Lachtar, Ubar Asi, Ubar Trunki. Several early Middle Hadrian complaints about sins in worse form, which are sometimes considerable in scope, contain same accusations of the same transgressions, but they are different, more personal, so to speak. The following excerpt from the 12th century Fora Lamentation for Sin addresses the sins of slander, theft, and fornication, and it reads as follows. The uh, equivalents of the large confession are uh, in red at the right. Just skip through it rapidly. I explain some passages uh, afterwards. Even if the Fora Lamentation contains most of the sins listed in the large catalogue, it is a far cry from the early medieval confessional formularies behind the latter. So the changes we see are not due to idiosyncrasy, but to the development of the text type. Traditional prose form is replaced by rhyme. Above all, however, the departure from the Carolingian formularies seem to allow a focus on the subject aware of his sins. Note the accumulation of pronouns in the first person singular. Let's have a closer look at two passages. Whereas at the beginning of the large confession, the speaker performs without further explanations the speech act of confessing, the speaker of the Fora text addresses himself explicitly to God. Nu vernimm rüvigen mich. Ich will mich ruhren wider dich. Ich bin's der wirrsiste Mann, der den Namen je gewann, dass er Christen sollte sie. And where the large confession simply states, Ich, you need us, I confess to envy, before our text elaborates in a far more tangible manner, dem ich wohl zu sprach, ich ne verliess es nie durch das, Ich narrierte immer an sin gut. But what does the poetic tradition of early Middle High German look like beyond the literature of religious practice? Another example. The Middle High German Etzulied is considered to be the first vernacular poem after the revival of tradition in the middle in the 11th century. It has survived in an older, shorter version from Strasbourg around 1130 and in a longer, younger version from Vorau from 12th or 13th century. The Strasbourg manuscript actually comes from Ochsenhausen near Memmingen in the Allgäu. Fora was a canon monastery and Ochsenhausen a Benedictine monastery that had joined uh, the Hilsa reform movement, which I mentioned before. According to the prologue of the Fora manuscript, the song was written by a man named Etzo at the suggestion of Bishop Gunther von Bamberg and set to music by a man named Wille. Here's the passage. Question. Der gute Bischof Gunther von Babenberg, der hier es machen ein viel gut Werche, er hier es die Sine Pfaffen ein gut Lied machen. Eines Liedes sie begunden, wann sie die Buch kunden, et so begunde schrieben, Wille fand die Wiese. You see, the rhymes are not quite what one would expect from uh, later periods. Uh, quite a pure. There is nothing unusual about this statement insofar as written tradition is still located in the clerical writing culture. As was the case in the early Middle Ages, a precise knowledge of the Bible is a prerequisite for poetic activity. The choice of the vernacular is unusual, but is not explicitly justified here. The situation is different in another contemporary source, this time in Latin, which mentions Etzo and his poetic activity. It is the Vita Alt Mani, the biography of Bishop Altmann von Passau, where the year 1065 is noted. I read the, the Latin version here. Uh, uh, the translation. <laughs> 
Eo tempore, quo terrore per moti non solum vulgaris, set et populorem primores genere et dignitate insignis, et ipsi diversarum civitatum episcopi magna gloria, et summa honore fulti patriam cognatus et divitias reliquerunt, et per artam viam crucem violantis Christum secutis. Quorum previus dux et incentur fuit Gunterus Babin Bergensis Episcopus, virtam corporis elegantia quam anime sapientia conspicuus, in cuius comitatu multi nominati viri et clerici et laici tam de orientali Francia quam de Bavaria fuerunt. Inter quos precipui duo canonici, canonici extiterunt, Videlicit etso scholasticus, ver omni sapientia et eloquentia preditus, qui in eodem itinere cantileam de miraculis Christi patria lingua nobilita composit. Etso scholasticus, who well have been a clergyman mentioned several times in Bamberg documents. The villa who was mentioned in the prologue was possibly the later abbot of the Michelsberg monastery in Bamberg. However, This song, the song was probably not initially composed ad hoc on the pilgrimage to the Holy Land mentioned in the source, but at some point beforehand. The subject matter is world history, which is interpreted as the history of salvation. From the beginning, Christ was destined to be the Redeemer. At the end of time, he will, will bring the righteous into his kingdom. Christ is first the God who existed before his incarnation, then the man who lives on earth, then the ruler of heaven, earth, and also hell. For the people, he is a redeemer, the mediator to God, and victor over the devil. Following Pope Gregory the Great, the victory over the devil is interpreted as some kind of pious fraud, Pia Fraus. Another passage. Von Holze huob sich der Tod. Von Holz gefiel er Gottelob, der Tierfil geniete an das Fleisch, der Angel was du Gottheit, nu ist es wohl ergangen, daran ward er gefangen. In this fight against the devil, however, Christ is also the commander, Herzoge. The believers are his servants. Etzo came up with all the images and patterns of interpretation for the biblical motives mentioned in the theological tradition. The structure of the song is a chronological narrative, but there are explanatory passages inserted as well as invocation and prayer-like uh, sections which again result from the more individual piety of the time which I mentioned earlier. Helmut de Boer, in the 1920s, quite some long ago, examined the linguistic form of this poem and some other subsequent works, identified a number of linguistic characteristics, I will now name the most important these. Quite a long list. The text of this period have relatively few adjectives with a decorative function. The adjectives used are actually descriptive, e.g. in einer engen Krippe, in a narrow crib, Tauben Ohren, Deaf Ears, etc., or they are commonplace adjectives like Gurt, Michel, which means big, Alt, Ewig, etc. An exception is Du Nebel, Finster Nacht, Dark and Misty Night, uh, an alliterative formula that also occurs outside the early Middle High German, for example, in old Frisian legal texts. So in this instance, Etzel was actually using a familiar inherited formula. Appositions are rare. On the few cases would be, one of the few cases would be Der Gottes Sohn war Sono von den Himmelen. God's son, with an O, a true son, you from heaven. There are only a few compounds. The rare examples that can be found are lexicalized cases such as Morgenstern and Morningstar. Etzo intersperses numerous Latin expressions with the High German. For example, Usa Genesi und us libro regum, from Genesis and from the Book of Kings, uh, or in fine seculorum dua erschein uns der Gottes Sohn. In the end of times, God's Son appeared to us. Mm, by nominal pairs such as in worten und in werken, by words and deeds, or in erde joch in himmele, 
on earth and, uh, and heaven are hallmarks of this style. There is clearly an influence of Latin rhetoric here. Six, the imagery and metaphors follow the path of the church symbolic language. Christ as a sun among the stars, the afterlife as the true home of man, etc. But metaphors are never used for purely poetic means. Another characteristic is the way sentences are joined together. There are basically three possibilities here. Firstly, a syndeton, i.e. a simple sequence with no conjunction between terms. Secondly, expressions with logical relationships marked with conjunctions. And finally, a mephora, where a connection is made by repeating an earlier constituent. There is some overlap between options two and three. The only thing that stands out in the exolete is that the first possibility, the ascendatic sequence, is very, very common. Already seen this passage, I read it again. Von Holze huob sich der Tod. Von Holze gefiel er Gotte Lob. Der Tier für Genita an das Fleisch. Der Angel war es die Gottheit. Du bist es wohl ergangen. Da an ward er erfangen. In this passage, we have already seen uh, each line is its own independent main clause. Well, uh, not uh, except for the last one. Da ran wart er gefangen, that's how he got caught, which shows an euphoric connection. Uh, concatenation with do is also characteristic of the style of this poem. Duo beging er ebraisken Sitte. Duo ward er circumcisus. Duo nannten sie in Jesus. This du or duo has lost its original local meaning. It has become a linking particle. Linking sentences with do is the most common form of anaphora in the Etzelit. However, if there are structures consisting of main and subordinate clauses, then they become confusing convoluted clauses whose structure is difficult to understand, such as Dur ihr Skinnen an der Werte, die Sternen, sorry, Biere zieten, relative clause, die der Filutze lichtes waren, so berchte, so sie waren, causal clause, wandte sie beschavote, du in der Befinster Nacht, relative clause, Du von dem Tier viel bekommen, relative clause, in des Gewählte wir alle waren, temporal clause, und sonst erst kein der Gottes Sohn, wahrer Sono von den Himmeln. The boss speaks of, quote, extensive sentence systems which had not yet been visibly been mastered from a linguistic perspective, unquote, uh, which, as he continues, must be regarded as the first attempt to reproduce the extensively branching constructions of Latin. Overall, the syntax of the Etzelit, and by extension the entirety of early Middle High German poetic corpus, uh, is home to only a few sentence structures, high structures made up of a main clause and a subordinate clause or subordinate clauses. In keeping with this, conjunctions that express, log ex express logical relationships are quite rare. The conjunction das is still most common, but it is semantically the weakest. Das connects main and subordinate clauses that may have very different logical relationships to one another. It is similar to anaphora. The most common anaphoric element is do or duo. As a rule of thumb, one line of verse equates to one sentence, this uh, kind of structure. And the sentence and the material to be communicated are one and the same. A rhetorical embellishment is rare, very rare. More than half of the absolute consists of single line sentences. The sequence of simple sentences is often further emphasized through parallelism. Von den Wurzen gab er ihm die Adren, von dem Grase gab er ihm das Haar, von dem Meere gab er ihm das Blut, von den Wolken das Mur. De Boer sees the syntactical and stylistic simplicity as a continuous conscious will of style, not as linguistic inability. The poet is concerned with emphasis and urgency. Decorative accessories, be it in the vocabulary of style, a structure are not present. <laughs> 
the fact that the syntactic peculiarities of this text are stylistically determined and that the German language in the early Middle High German period was well suited to composing logically structured sentences will now be illustrated using an example from a prose text. It is a section from the translation of the treatise Devia Tutibus Eviciis on virtues and vices by Alcuin which has come down to us in the Composite Manuscript Munich, uh, CLM 7637. The Middle High German translation of the chapter De Sapientia, Wisdom, reads as follows. Mm. You should have the translation somewhere on your virtual <laughs> handout, but I'll come back to the uh, Middle High German text. Vor allen Dingen soll männische Erforschung, welche sie, siehe die wahre Gewisse da und die wahre Wiesheit, wandte, causal conjunction, die Wiesheit ihre Werte, ist ein Tumpheit vor Gotte. Die wahre Gewissete ist das, syntactical subordination, Du dich bekehrest von den Sonntonen, die, syntactical subordination, des Tüfels dienes sind und die wahre Wiesheit ist, das, syntactical subordination, du Gott übest nach der Wahrheit seiner Gebote. Despite its relative complexity, the construction you just heard or saw is clearly transparent. In diesen zwei Dingen, so wird der ewige Lieb gewinnen, also David spricht. Kehre dich von dem Obele und zu tue das Gurt, wann, causal conjunction, es ende nur geht nach Heime, das, syntactical subordination, er das Ubel vermiedet, er eine Welle das Gurte tun. Noch enthilfet nicht, dass er das Gurte tut, er eine Welle das Ubele verlassen. Aller der so Wiese ist, der ist ahne Zwiefel immer salig, das ist aber der salige Lieb, das du Gott erkennest. This comparison so shows that the simplicity of the syntactic structures in the early Middle High German poems has nothing to do with some systematic constraints, the author's linguistic incompetence, or with the restrictions imposed by the poetic form, but rather is a consciously used stylistic device. The treatise also differs from the poem in terms of vocabulary. Complex abstracts. Uh, Occur, such as Behurtunge, der Gottes Gebote, obey God's commands, Gottes Gnade und nicht misse truon, do not distrust God's mercy, ein Brutte Salin, der Figente, the terror of the enemies, and so on. Such word formations are scarcely found in early Middle High German poetry. We will now move on from these examples of how the early Middle High German speakers and writers used their language. We are ill-informed of what speakers of early Middle High German thought about early Middle High German, even compared to Old High German or Classical and Late Middle High German, with one notable exception. The author of the so-called Old German Vienna Genesis, which probably originated from around 1060 or 1080 in today's Austria, tells a very vivid version of the creation story, especially when it comes to the creation of man and its senses. <coughs> it starts this way. Er, that's God, tät an dem an Lutze sieben Locher Nutze, zwei an den Ohren, dass er wo gehoren, Joch zwei Augen, dass er sehe dir getaugen, zwei an der Nase, dass er stinken mugge, in dem Munde eines, so nutzten ist der Reines. That's it. What then follows is the first surviving attempt in German to describe the articulatory production of speech sounds although there are, of course, numerous models, especially from the Latin tradition, which the author might have used as a guide. In dem Munde, yes, er hangen, well, I won't show you exactly <laughs> which uh, <laughs> I meant now, uh, eine Zungenlange, fuhre die Ilte er machen, einen Kinnebachen, zahne zwei Gefährte, 
Beinen viel Härte, dass er das Essen, dass sie das Essen brechen und dass die Zunge spreche. Svenne sie den Wind fahrt und in, in den Mund zuhit, an den Zahnen sie skäpfet das Wort, das sie spricht. This nice example brings us to the end of this rough overview of the early middle high German textual types and transmission spectrum. I'll sum up the main points again. At the beginning of the early Middle High German period, around the middle of the 11th century, writing was still not yet prominent amongst lay culture. But in the course of early Middle High German, i.e. from the middle to the 11th to the third quarter of the 12th century, a lay <coughs> audience gradually emerged. This audience was served by spiritual authors with two major areas of writing. On the one hand with poetic texts, on the other hand with texts on religious practice and instruction. A large part of, early Middle High German, of the early Middle High German corpus is an intersection of both of these being, by being poetic and religiously instructive. Of course, linguistic communication also took place outside the religious uh, domain in the 11th and 12th centuries, but little or nothing at all has survived from everyday usage. This also applies to the traditional forms of poetry, the medium of self-assurance of the illiterate early medieval warrior nobility. We know through indirect evidence that these traditions were continued orally, but none of this made it onto parchment, for it was not literature of sufficient interest to clerical circles. Finally, what is still missing in this first phase of Middle High German is literature of secular practice. We only have sparse remnant of legal texts and no actual documents, no private records, no court files or other texts that are close to everyday life. What does this overview reveal for the possibilities of German language historiography at, uh, in the 11th and 12th centuries? Again, only an excerpt of the reality of language is visible in the sources and by no means uh, the German that was spoken in all its dimensions and aspects. We are dealing with texts from the religious sphere, except for sermons, which were delivered in prose, most still in poetic stylization. On this basis, one can reconstruct the grammar of the time to a certain extent, the morphology of nouns, verbs, etc., because the existing corpus is so large that all grammatical categories and forms can be found somewhere. Phonetic developments that have taken place in uh, Old High German can also be reconstructed on the basis of these texts. However, our understanding of the syntax already becomes a little problematic because on the one hand, the verse form could come into conflict with the natural word order. On the other hand, the prose is consistently translation prose, like the Alpine example, uh, and as such is more or less dependent on Latin structures. The biggest gap, however, is the vocabulary. Large areas of everyday lexicon have never been put on parchment and this only changes fundamentally in the second half of the 13th century. That will be so next week. Thank you very much. Great cliffhanger. Uh, uh, thank you so much for giving this lecture series. Uh, it's wonderful to have a proper linguist, uh, Vargas, for those dabbling into, <laughs> uh, and it, it, but I, I really appreciate that you have taken the time to find original examples. So this is stuff you won't find in any textbook. Uh, so uh, uh, you are the first to uh, hear this kind of evidence. Um, we have recorded uh, already lecture three to five. Yes, that's true. Um, so you more than half. Or yeah, uh, I'll upload it probably on Monday, so you can binge watch uh, uh, classical High German, <laughs> Middle High German, late Middle High German. With moderation. And, yeah, <laughs> and the the last uh, two lectures will go up uh, slightly later in in term. So, but uh, it has been a real privilege to have you in, in Oxford and I hope to uh, be able to uh, welcome you back at some point. It was a pleasure for me too. Mm -hmm. Quite instructive to uh, 
speak about the history of German in a foreign language.